Okay, so let's see how things are going. So I'm trying a few things new on the back end here. So um, just sort of stay tuned, right? One of the things I'm going to try differently this time is to actually speak in complete sentences. So here we go. We're off in chapter one. Chapter one is, well, it, it, it's, it's an overview of the entire book, right? So you want to be careful about getting too bogged down in the, uh, the different definitions and, and all of the words that show up, right? Because, of course, we're going to be going through these things piece by piece, little by little all over the semester so you shouldn't think about uh, getting too hung up about that on the other hand though you should be for the most part you should recognize words terms concepts that came from the fall right and so that's the co uh, concern that we have is that we have a lot of catch up to do so um, Chapter 1 and Chapter 2 will be what we'll be talking about over the next uh, several lectures. And if you're keeping up with your uh, readings from your fall genetics book, you'd be looking at Chapters 8, 12, and 13. I encourage you to look outside of the textbook readings. There are hundreds of good books out there for you to, to look at. I've listed just a few here and when you go to Canvas and you look at the page called some BI 308 resources you'll find a page called books mentioned in lecture and so it has these books but as well as additional books and while it has links to Amazon, uh, don't think about I'm not getting any money if you click and buy on those things and whatnot. So that's one of the reasons why I put the links in Canvas so we can kind of remove any of that, uh, you know, pretext that your instructor is making money off you in some way. All right. Um, in particular, a book that I recommend that you get into is this one by Matt Ridley called Genome. And so it's an interesting uh uh, journey, if you will. He takes the, our 23 chromosomes and he goes through and he picks one gene and he spends a chapter talking about that gene. Nice, easy discourse, uh, very interesting, and it's an award winning book. It's been around for a number of years, uh, so that's a good one. Um, another one that you should be aware of, particularly those of you who are going off into you know, medicine one way or another, public health or, or becoming medical doctors or nurses or what have you. Uh, this is a f now a quite famous book. It's called The Emperor of All Maladies. And it's uh, 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 about cancer. And it's written by, uh, uh, at the time, he was a uh, young physician, an oncologist. And again, just a fantastic book, a good read. And when I teach the cancer biology course it's one of the books that I, I require my students to, to read then other kinds of another cancer book is the Philadelphia chromosome um, the rest of these are about genetics um, a classic in the field is by Richard Dawkins called the selfish gene this was written back in 1976 of all things but he revolutionized a number of aspects about how we think about the evolution of genes and you should know this person in part because um, he's the one that coined the phrase or the the concept of a meme just saying okay so we move on um, where we're headed obviously uh, you know the mechanics of the course require that we have exams from from time to time and so uh, the way to study for exams of course is to to be able to predict the kinds of questions that are going to be on the exam, right? And so um, exam one is going to have some review questions, right? Review questions from the f general principles and concepts that we talked about in your first semester genetics course. 
in particular though as it pertains to this course we want to revisit the idea of information flow in biology right um, and so in a very simple way the pathway hypothesis we talked about um, is that we go from DNA to RNA to protein so putting it in our, our spring semester course context we, we think about the genome which then is expressed via the transcriptome yielding from time to time uh, the proteome another question that we're going to want to address and this is also a, a substantial part of what you're going to do in the lab course uh, from a bioinformatics perspective is to think about how do we go from phenotype diversity how do we get that and certainly genetics is a part of that and so uh, we'll talk more about that as we go and particularly again we'll have some exercises and some project based work in the lab that pertains to this question we also start by talking about simply what's in the genome and obviously our focus is on the human genome but we will talk about other genomes as well and we'll need to talk about this is the uh, chapter two part we're going to need to talk about how to study the genome and then in chapters three and four which we'll talk about as as we get going about how to map the genome and of course how to sequence the genome beginning our review you should have a working definition of what genetics is I don't think this scenario somebody asking asking you on the street is gonna happen but you never know so let's define it together genetics is the study of structure and function of genes inheritance how genes or information is transferred from generation to generation variation how different copies the alleles of genes are distributed in populations and of course development how gene products interact to affect the organisms over the course of the organism's lifetime so that's what we mean by genetics genomics is a subdiscipline of genetics and so I thought this would be a good point to go ahead and just sort of define various sub-disciplines of the genetics. So for the genome, the focus is on the entire set of DNA in a cell or collectively an organism. Uh, for eukaryotes, we would want to distinguish between the nuclear genome, so all of the DNA in the nucleus, and the genome that's part of the organelles, right? So mitochondria, if you're a an animal or a plant chloroplasts if you're just a plant they have their own genomes next up is the transcriptome and so this has a, a, um, a definition that's changed over the years and so this is one of my first warning uh, messages about relying on the internet when you take my exams we are defining the transcriptome as follows it's the entire set of RNA transcripts that are present in the cell so this includes both the coding and the non-coding RNAs so a sub part of the transcriptome is called the exome and that would be all of the coding messenger RNAs that are present in the cell at a particular time and so this is where you will get in trouble with with the definition of transcriptome on the genome or in, in the internet you'll find some of the definitions are that the transcriptome is all of the coding messenger RNAs that, that is the exome not the transcriptome okay related to the transcriptome related to the exome is we routinely do what's called expression profiling where we compare cells that have been exposed to a toxicant and we notice the messenger RNAs that are present in the control group the unexposed group versus the treatment group 
by comparing the two, we can get a picture about the regulation that's going on, the change in response to the environment and how the cell is mediating that potentially stressful situation. And then finally, a substantial part of the semester, maybe about a month's worth, we'll spend talking about the proteome. So our basic definition of the proteome is that it includes all of the proteins that are expressed by a cell organ, the organism, at a particular time. By no means are these the only ohms in biology. So an ohm is kind of an overall, right? Collectively everything. And so another ohm that we'll, we'll see in this semester is the epigenome, which includes all the epigenetic modifications in the cell. Promoter sequences can be methylated when you have CPG islands, the C gets a methyl group added to this. And if you get a string of the CPG, CPG all methylated, this will slow down or in some cases prevent RNA polymerase from transcribing the gene. And what's interesting about epigenetics is that this doesn't involve change in DNA sequence, but it does have an effect on expression and so therefore it can alter phenotypes and so this is a, an important and relatively recent introduction into the idea of how genes are regulated and from a uh, biotech perspective it, it suggests a, a mechanism for for modifying what genes are doing and perhaps in a therapy way so people are pretty excited about this um, other ohms, the metabolome, that's all the met metabolites present in the cell. The glycome, all the sugars or carbohydrates present in the cell. You've heard of the microbiome, certainly. Those are the, the microorganisms that are living in your gut. Then, of course, you should know the big one, which is the biome. So the biome is the first ohm that was talked about. I think it was actually defined back in, or, or named back in like 1917, if I have my ecology notes in front of me. And it, it was the, the first term used to describe the life forms that are associated with major habitat types. And so another uh, concept or topic that name that you'll hear is like life zones or biotic communities. But it also includes other things now. And uh, so that's one additional and very important ohm that's not part of our genetics. Okay, so back to genetics. Uh, it's again the discipline that studies how and why individuals differ. And what we mean by individuals, of course, is we can range from, at least in principle, if lice found on other planets, we would be able to compare uh, phenotypes of individuals on those different planets. Um, but certainly we compare the genetic information content of different ecosystems, different biomes. And then, of course, we can think about individuals could be collections of cells as part of organs and organ systems, tissues, on down to individual cells and the organelles themselves. So we can talk about variation at all those levels and ask what are the genetic basis of that variation. As a reminder, phenotypes are what we can see or measure about organisms. Uh, traits are aspects of the phenotype that we can give names to. Um, traits range from the proteins, so hemoglobin. Um, the trait could be simply the amount of hemoglobin that's in your blood. Um, we can talk about the presence, absence of the liver. We can talk about how large your liver is, uh, a, a phenotype that, that I hope you all are aware of is a, is a risk factor of prolonged alcohol abuse, right? It's a way to get cirrhosis. Um, uh, hema, uh, what is it? Uh, no, I can't think of the term now. Hepatitis, sorry. Hepatitis is a, is a known risk factor for cirrhosis of the liver. Uh, the good news is if you stop drinking and if you treat the uh, hepatitis, uh, the liver 
can regenerate, um, unlike some of the other organs we have. Um, a more uh, mundane phenotype, height, how tall are we? Tall versus short, we could categorize that way, but of course height is a continuous trait, varies from individual by, by millimeters and centimeters, not necessarily by leaps and bounds and feet to miles, right? Okay, so that puts out the, uh, the next categorization, if you will, about phenotypes is we can think about presence-absence characters. So those are discontinuous. Yes, no, okay, you either have it or you don't, versus traits that are continuous. And so this can blend into one another. For example, we think of type 2 diabetes as a discontinuous type of trait. You either have it or you don't. However, we all know or should know that you don't just wake up one morning and have type 2 diabetes. It's a long progression to that. And so it's called a threshold trait. And so in that sense, it's a continuous trait. Uh, over time, progressively dealing with sugar becomes an issue. Pancreas shuts down, insulin resistance, et cetera, et cetera. And so we have markers that allow us to see the progression of that well before type 2 diabetes is actually ascertained. Okay. Um, so, yeah. All right. So, first question for you Genes code for polypeptides or parentheses proteins. True or false? Explain your choice. So I'll give you a moment to, to go ahead and do that. Key part of learning is putting yourself out there. Answer it. It's true or false. And then explain why you selected that choice. Okay, that's about 10 seconds for you to have answered. Um, the reason I give you an explain your choice is so that it forces you to defend why you selected true or false. So if you said true, you're emphasizing the word code. So when we talked about this in my class 307 in the fall, we try to restrict our use of the word code when we're talking about genes that code for proteins. So in that sense, it's true. However, if you're thinking about the concept of genes, you should answer it false because other functional products, RNA, like transfer RNA, ribosomal RNA, etc., they come from genes too. They don't come from coding genes, they come from non-coding genes. Here's a second question dealing with an important concept in genetics. Consider each person on campus. We all have the same genes. True or false? And again, explain your choice. We're all humans, so the simplest answer is to say true. If you're thinking about the difference between males and females, then you're sort of parsing it pretty close, right? The Y chromosome has about 60 protein coding genes on it. Half of those are also found on the X chromosome. So you're talking about 30 genes that are unique to the Y chromosome, 30 genes out of a total of well over 19,000 protein coding genes in the human genome. So the difference between males and females, if you want to get strict to it, it's like, well, yep, there's 30 genes on the Y chromosome that are not found on the X chromosome. In other words, the similarity even with 
the X and the Y is over 99.5%. So <laughs> for all practical purposes, we're the same. So in order to say false, you would have to say something about the difference between the X and the Y chromosome, where the sort of the walk around knowledge will get you in trouble is that it's like, well, wait, we, we were genetically different from each other, right? And so, of course, the difference is that we don't have the same copies of genes. We all have the same genes, but we don't necessarily have the same copies. And we call those copies alleles. So again, that's why I give you in these true-false, I'm going to want you to explain yourself. We don't want to leave it just to a sort of a coin toss kind of thing. Okay, so gene definition. Your book doesn't really have a good definition. It, it has, uh, like all textbooks, it's now gone through four, th four editions, and your textbook that you used in the fall semester has gone through 12 editions. And the problem with that is that they don't always update as they should. And in about a week's time, we're going to bring up the ENCODE project, and we're going to explain why this has caused uh, a, a schism in the world of genetics. Uh, but basically, the definition that, that you had prior to taking genetics at the college level um, was not sufficient. So we've tried to come up with something that's a more workable definition. And so we certainly will borrow from the old way of thinking in the following sense. Uh, the gene is a fundamental unit of inheritance. In terms of its molecular definition, though, we'll say that the, it's a DNA sequence that is transcribed to yield a functional product. What are the functional products? Well, proteins, that's certainly one class of functional products, but the other class, again, are functional RNAs. Again, transfer RNAs, ribosomal RNAs, microRNAs. Where do you think they come from? They come from genes. The end product after processing is RNA, though, not protein. So those are non-coding genes. They don't code for protein but they certainly yield a functional product. So that definition, DNA sequence that is transcribed to yield functional product, gives you a working definition that allows you to discriminate DNA sequences. If they are never transcribed, then we would hold that they're not actually a gene. The definition doesn't necessarily fit every situation, so I listed some limitations of the definition, maybe saying exceptions a little bit strong, but certainly there are complications in terms of the definition. For example, do you include the regulatory sequences? Now the UTRs, the prime, you know, five prime UTR, three prime UTR, those are transcribed, uh, but the promoter sequences are not, the enhancer sequences are not, right? They're certainly necessary though for the transcription of the gene and so in previous definitions you would find that they would include the regulatory sequences uh, but practically for many many genes we don't have a complete set of all of the regulatory sequences that are necessary for the transcription of the gene. Operons found in prokaryotes, operons a single regulatory sequence is shared by multiple genes that are located in, in the genome one after the other. So how does that correspond to our definition? Uh, Transplicing. So in eukaryotes, many genes um, are the coding regions, we call them exons, are interspersed by non-coding sequences called introns. Those introns are removed and spliced together the exons. In some cases, in different tissues, combinations of the exons are spliced differently. So how does our definition meet that? It doesn't exactly. Viruses, 
in particular viruses, but there's also some evidence that this phenomenon is found in, in bacteria and perhaps even in us where depending there are alternate start sites to the transcription of a particular gene so in effect there can be multiple genes in the same region of the chromosome and so in this case we call these overlapping genes where an alternate start site means that you read the sequence differently and a different functional product may be produced and then the last exception or limitation of the gene is the process called RNA editing. RNA editing is follows transcription, follows the, the mRNA being processed and then exported into the cytoplasm and enzymes that are specific for this function grab up the messenger RNA and change the message by one nucleotide yielding a different functional product than what was prescribed by the gene. So it's certainly since 2007 with the first publications of the ENCODE project as we've gained a deeper understanding with new technology and new approaches to this our, our settled definition of a gene uh, is well it's less than settled uh, and the importance of this is, as we'll find in the lab, when we're trying to identify DNA sequences, we have to use definitions. That's what bioinformatics does. Definitions then are more properly called algorithms in bioinformatics, where you set the conditions and you throw the sequences into a search function, or search mode, and you pull out identities of sequences based on the definitions that you use. But let's backtrack. Okay, so what, what do we know and what can we say about genes? Well, genes are a type of DNA element. So that phrase isn't used in your book, unfortunately, in a consistent way, but basically think of it this way. The sequence of DNA in your genome, if you added it all up, we're talking about in the human genome, well over three billion base pairs long. Within that though, we can identify groupings. I already mentioned that there's approximately 19,000 protein coding genes in this. That means that we can identify the sequences because they have certain characteristics in common. So genes are example of a DNA element. Another DNA element though is for example the promoter sequences. So if you recall the TATA box is part of the promoter sequence we can find the TATA box throughout the genome, but particularly clustered adjacent to the protein coding genes. Again, we define that as part of the protein, or part of the, the uh, coding sequence, the promoter regions. Okay. Um, the products of translation apply to proteins. I have this as an end result of translation, but it shouldn't be because functional RNAs are not produced by translation. They are the end result of processing following transcription. Um, another part about thinking about genes, and <laughs> we try to be positive here, but pretty quickly we get negative. Don't say it this way. So for example, we would never say that there's a gene for intelligence. Intelligence is a complicated phenotype and so we would expect it to be to the extent that you can even quantify what you mean by intelligence you would expect it to be under the control of tens to hundreds to thousands of genes so it's what we would call a polygenic trait but in addition to that genes while they code for a single product that product then interacts through development, correct? In which case, phenotypes can be affected by a single gene, so that's one example, but a phenotype can be affected by multiple genes, so that's polygenic, 
but then you can reverse it and look at that single gene. It'll have an effect on multiple different kinds of phenotypes. So that's an example of what you call pleiotropic. We already mentioned that variants of the allele of genes are called alleles, so we'll move there. Uh, so alleles, you can think of them as differences in nucleotide bases within a sequence at a particular location in the genome. So that's locus, right? A particular position in the genome. It's a location. And of course, we can extend that idea that alleles apply to any position in the genome where you can compare one cell to another cell or one individual to another individual. And so the various classes of DNA elements besides genes includes regulatory regions. People can differ for those. Uh, promoter regions, UTRs, the examples, of regulatory regions, pseudogenes, so there's about 19,000 protein coding genes. There is many pseudogenes, and if you recall, pseudogenes look like genes, look like typical protein coding genes, but they lack the regulatory sequences associated with them, so therefore they're never transcribed. So, going back to our definition, our definition allows us to discriminate between actual genes and pseudogenes because pseudogenes are not transcribed. Other classes of DNA elements present in the, the genome are things called transposons. Transposons are further divided into types, lines, signs, etc., etc. And it turns out the transposons are the most numerous kind of element in your genome. The human genome has, I think it's 44%. So if you added up all the nucleotides in the genome, what percentage of them are found in transposons? And the answer is about 44% of them. Continuing in our primer, uh, figuring out where genes are. This is also an introduction to thinking about mapping. The whole point about mapping is to be able to point it to some place. And so along the right is a uh, colored version of what we call an ideogram. So you draw a chromosome as a single line um, because your book spends money having graphic artists working so that that line becomes sort of a three-dimensional and there's some shading and some other things going on but just draw a line and what you do is you find the center mirror and so if the center mirror is not exactly in the midpoint then there's going to be a short arm and a long arm and so by convention the short arm is called the P arm the long arm is called the Q arm and then from the beginnings of genetics that come from histology, uh, they literally went to the Garmic districts in, in New York City and in other places and they grabbed fabric dyes and so they started throwing the different dyes onto their cell preparations under the microscope. And it turned out that you can find dyes that, that will stain nucleic acids and not other things or they will stain proteins and not other things. And so the early microscopists found that chromosomes would show very distinctive banding patterns given a particular application of a stain. So these banding patterns remain present and they are found in all of us and so they're stable features of chromosomes because if you remember as we now know chromosomes are not just DNA, chromosomes are also protein. And you should be thinking the next thought is that the kind of proteins they are are histones. So at any rate, though, those bands, we number them moving away from the centimere. The further away from the centimere, the larger the number. Okay, so at long last, we can locate a gene in the genome by giving it a script. The first question, where is a gene located? Well, it's got to be found on a chromosome. That's the organizational structure of the genome. You don't have a single strand of DNA that's 3.3 billion base pairs long. 
you have chromosome 1, chromosome 2, chromosome 3. Each of those is a DNA molecule. Chromosome 1 is, if I remember correctly, is about 260 million base pairs long, and so on and so forth, with chromosome 1 being the largest, chromosome 2 being the next largest, and so on and so on. The smallest chromosome in the human genome is chromosome 22. The Y chromosome is a little bit larger than chromosome 22, but not by much. But at long last, then, to the question, so for example, the BRCA2 gene, uh, so she, uh, it's a uh, tumor suppressor protein. It, it's involved in, in the cell cycle and dozens of mutations in this very, very large gene are associated with high risk of breast cancer. And it's found, here's how we would tell people where to go looking. 13, that's chromosome 13. So the chromosome number would be first. Q, well that tells us that it's on the Q arm, the longer arm. And then 12.3, it tells us that it's going to be pretty close to the centromere. Okay, moving on to sort of the next way of thinking about it. Remember the point of genetics is to figure out why we all differ. And so uh, I approach this from a statistical point of view. And so I wanted to introduce a couple of, of statistical concepts that we'll be using throughout the semester. And the first one is a simple equation that comes from the field called quantitative genetics. And that is, if you have a series of people and you measure them for a particular phenotype, P, okay, why do individuals differ? Well, it's not that they have different genes, but they definitely have different alleles at those genes, and that variation certainly contributes to the difference in the phenotype. The other way, of course, that we differ is that we experience and we have different environmental experiences throughout our development. I'm different from you for a whole variety of reasons, but in a simple way, I was different from you even when I was in my 20s. Um, I experienced different, I grew up on a small island uh, just east of Seattle, Washington. Um, cold, temperate, rainy Seattle area, um, different foods, you name it, right? So. Certainly that experience of the environment is, is different from what you would have experienced growing up in Hawaii or, or Iowa or someplace else. And then there's the potential that the alleles that we all have uh, are particularly sensitive in terms of gene expression to particular environments. And so at any rate, this equation is a useful way of talking about why do individuals differ. Well, if they have the same genes, so like identical twins, okay, if they experience different environments, that's how we can explain why they're not exactly the same. Another measure that we'll talk about, and this will be more relevant uh, when we get into um, some of the, the lab exercise I have to do, but we can talk about a single measure to characterize populations as having lots of variation or little variation, but coming up with a, a measure of the frequency of heterozygotes per locus that are in the population. And that's given the, this is the definition here, and this, the, we'll just label it big H. Another statistic that we'll want to talk about throughout the semester is the idea of a mutation rate. Um, so for example, because of uh, the process of mutation, um, we would expect between offspring and parents about 100 new alleles to be present. So that's the mutation rate per generation is about 100 new alleles. Okay. An application of this. So for example, you're working with a, a strain of mice, get a double recessive hit, 
they don't have a functioning enzyme that converts a certain uh, hormone, okay? And so the natural state of the mouse is, is big and plump. This is an identical sibling, however, medicine was given. Now the two mice eat the same amount of food, but the uh, therapy, the drug that was given to the sibling, uh, interacts with the missing enzyme and so a process is replaced, a metabolic process is replaced, and so the mouse maintains a normal weight. So this is a case in where, you know, the alleles that we have, the genetics that we're talking about that inter inter interact to produce a phenotype, you don't want to think about that as sort of destiny. The whole point about medicine is to intervene with the things that go wrong metabolically. And some of the metabolic processes that go wrong are certainly have a genetic component, but it's about finding the right combination of therapy that can make a big difference. All right. Switching slides here is hung up. There we go. Yeah, okay, sorry about that, here we are. So a substantial part of the course is to think about why we are the way we are. And so it's a, a useful framework to recognize that we have two ways of explaining why we are the way we are. And so those are sort of the how questions and the why questions. How questions are proximate mechanisms, like talking about biochemical pathways, how those are different among us and that can those differences can accumulate into type 2 diabetes, for example. But another way to approach why we are the way we are is from an evolutionary perspective, ultimate causation, the idea that we have certain characteristics that make us human comes from a long line of being human. And at some point, going back, primates share it, et cetera, et cetera. So at any rate, um, we'll, we'll show you a way in lab that using this approach, the ultimate causation evolutionary perspective, can help you uh, tease apart why we are the way we are. Uh, just a quick definition of what we mean by evolution. We mean heritable changes in populations over time. So let's pick a, a phenotype, and that's height in humans. Before I do that, let's list the conditions that are necessary for evolution. Heritable changes in populations over time. The conditions necessary include, well, clearly individuals must vary. Genetic variation must be present to explain some of that variation. And then the final part is that, is the feature, the phenotype in question, or the different states correlated with having more kids? or greater chance of survival. Okay, and remember, evolution refers to populations, not individuals. Individuals don't evolve, they develop. So our height example. Various metrics all agree over the past couple of centuries, average heights and populations have increased pretty dramatically. So the question is, why? So condition one, do individuals vary? Well, absolutely. So this is a graph I'd love to get repeated if I can get all of Chaminade students to agree to do this, get you to line up on Middle Road, and then we'll get some, somebody with a, a, a camera and uh, put them up in the, in the sky and take a picture. This is a nice histogram. So clearly the condition one, yes, individuals differ for a phenotype. Uh, genetic variation must be present, so the trait must be heritable is another way of saying it. So is height heritable? So a few years ago I, I asked for volunteers to, to give me information about their height and tell me something about their parents' height. And so that's one way of calculating what's called the heritability. And simply 
this line between you take the average of the parent's height and plot that against the, the, the kid's height and if you see a line going up okay it tells you that the traits heritable and this is just a common observation that pretty much everybody knows um, it's not a perfect relationship okay but if you were to guess how tall my parents are my guess is that you wouldn't say that they're both over seven feet tall that they're probably about five foot six if you took the mid-parent value and that's about what they would be all right so point being height is clearly a heritable condition in humans so that meets condition two so far we're two for two variation and heritability okay and another way of looking at this of course we can now move past simple measures of just the phenotype we can get into the molecular differences right and so we can interview or introduce the idea of single nucleotide polymorphisms so you take a collection of individuals you look at the same spot in the genome and you ask a simple question what do you look like at that that locus so we have chromosome 2 of course you have two copies because we're the you get a copy from mom and a copy from dad right so this is the genotype for this individual individual 4 they're the same individual 2 they're different individual five they're different and so on and so forth okay so that phenotype differences that we got just simply you know comparing everyone against a ruler is manifested down at the genetic level and so there are large-scale studies that have tried to say okay we know that height is heritable in that simple linear regression sense how much of that heritability can be explained by single nucleotide polymorphisms and the answer so here's our best estimate of heritability about 80 percent of the variation in height can be explained basically because of your parents all right and so this study uh, from a few years ago I guess 2014 looked at over 250,000 individuals scored them for about 700 SMPs that are associated with height differences so together that explained about 60% of this so this is kind of a, a, a an interesting research question how come when we look at all of the variation at the molecular level it doesn't explain the 80% it only can explain about half of that so that's called the missing heritability But at any rate, what have we demonstrated so far? There's clearly genetic variation for height to explain at least partly the variation of phenotypes. So con you know, condition one and condition two are met. So the third one, um, is there a correlation with reproductive success or survivorship? And the answer is, first of all, it's a little hard to do that in humans, right? You're not gonna be doing an experiment on these things, hint, hint. Uh, but when we look at observational studies, what we find instead of there being a linear association with taller people having more kids, it's, it's a curve linear relationship, intermediate height. So what that suggests is that increasing trend in height is not likely to continue. And probably it has nothing to do with an evolution sense, changes in, in alleles, and it has more to do with changes in the environment. Okay, evolutionary theory then combines the idea that mutation is the raw material. Changes in genetics uh, within populations is the stuff that you work with, generates new phenotypes. And then environmental change selects successful phenotypes or conversely unsuccessful genotypes. But then you also have to throw in random events because uh, way to change allele frequencies in a population it, it can simply be chance you know major extinction events that wipe out whole populations of a species will clearly change the genetic constitution of a species and then over time of course you can only work with what you got so that's called genetic drift and natural selection is a more purposeful 
directional kind of change, but those are the two processes that are responsible for evolution of populations. Another equation that we can think of comes from quantitative genetics, and this is a simple one. So the response to a change in environment, the change in environment we would call a selection agent, okay, is proportional to how heritable the phenotype is. So a little benefit being taller, okay, in heritability, we can predict what the next generation will look like, and you can do this over and over again. And again, some of you will be thinking, oh, well, we can't do evolution experiments. And of course, you're not thinking about uh, farming practices, uh, ranching practices. Uh, we have generated, if you will, all kinds of things that make money for people based on this equation. Okay, so it looks like I'm running out of time here. So I'm going to go ahead and stop that with a nice picture of, of dogs and we'll talk about artificial selection and how that's a model for thinking about why we are the way we are um, on Friday. So thank you.